thankful to a master english training for sponsoring a zoom account and for uh, today's webinar i am joined with dr maria vergara ivar dr maria vergara ivar is from argentina and So Dr. Maria will share about herself and take us to her presentation. Over to you, Dr. Maria. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone. I'm very glad to be in this webinar, and I really thank all the organization um, and all the people who are present in this webinar. May I start sharing the screen? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Well, there we go. Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, according to the places you are seeing um, this webinar. Uh, my topic is integral and formative assessment in ELT and some steps to success uh, according to um, research that we have carried out, carried out some years ago. Well, uh, the contents we are going to deal with are, uh, in the first place, defining integral as well as assessment for learning. And then from these concepts and keywords, we are going to be talking about hinge questions, CCQs, ICQ questions, and other kinds of questions that may help us in our teaching, uh, in, our teaching in, in the classrooms. Once we deal with all the questions and some examples, we are going to talk about the types of mistakes, errors, and slips that sometimes we can observe in our students. Finally, we are going to deal with feedback for learning and different other concepts that have to do with feedback uh, within assessment for learning. Well, to start with, we have defining assessment. So we are going to um, be talking about some of the characteristics of assessment and why we consider it to be integral. The work that I am presenting is part of a research project that we have carried out in Argentina in some institutions in higher education, but also um, with my experience in kindergarten and primary schools. So I hope you liked it, you like it, and you can participate with your ideas or the things you are doing in your classes. First of all, I would like you to write in the chat box, to drop in the chat box, some key concepts related to assessment. What concepts do you know about assessment? Anything that comes to your mind from the top of your head, some words related to assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, words related to assessment, uh-huh. Let's see, you say feedback, uh-huh.
holistic assessment. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, one more. Checking, very good. Concept checking, very good. CCQ, uh huh. Standards to measure against, very good. We should assess uh, what we already taught. E exactly, very good. Formative assessment and evaluation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So here are a couple of um, concepts that we can deal with. Assessment for learning, as we have said at the beginning, is one concept that was developed by Dylan William in England um, some 10 years ago with Black. And they had devised this assessment for learning as a, as a way of um, deriving from the formal evaluation uh, dealing with scoring. So they said that they better, teachers better comment or give comments and reports on the students' performances. We're going to deal with that. They call it AFL, Assessment for Learning, and we're going to deal with that in a moment. The assessment that we are talking about is integral. Integral assessment covering other issues that have to do with evaluating students, not just the measurement. Then hinge questions, I don't know if you are acquainted with, Yes, hinge questions is part of assessment for learning. And also, um, this is one of the key words in Dylan William. Regulation of knowledge or self-regulation of knowledge is a word, is a concept. In fact, it's a concept that um, is quite new and, have to do, and has to do with self-evaluation and peer evaluation. They are all related to the collection of evidence in order to see how they have performed and what things we, uh, we need to do afterwards. So this is also related to feedback for learning and a new concept as well, uh, feed forward. So these concepts are some of the ones that we can recall when thinking about assessment and evaluation. Of course, this is a wide uh, topic, and we are going to cover some areas of those um, in order to see how to deal with them in the classroom. It's what I can, uh, what I can contribute with, and what, um, and the word you are also invited to talk and give your ideas about what you are doing with evaluation and assessment in your uh, in your classrooms. First, I would like to introduce two authors. I've been talking about Dylan William, and Dylan William is um, this British uh, researcher who's been working with assessment for quite a while, and uh, he deals with assessment for learning or embedded assessment. Embedded because it's embedded into the classroom, into the institutions, and he works with the teachers of that institution, observing, and analyzing what is happening with, um, with the comments of, of the teachers, the students, and the people uh, in the project. On the other way, we have um, a Spanish researcher in education. His name is Santos Guerra. Santos Guerra is a prolifer prolific writer and he's written a lot of books on evaluation and education. His view on assessment and evaluation is that of um, an emotional one, uh, one that has to do with how the student feel when being evaluated. Uh, one of his quotations is teaching is not only a way of earning our life, it is above all a way of winning the life of the others. So he's thinking about this teacher who is engaging, this teacher who promotes learning in the classroom and who is very confident 
in order to come up with a good performance on the part of the students. And I would like to, to go on talking about um, Santos Guerra. Uh, one of his book is called Evaluate with the Heart. So we need to have in mind our heart, emotions, our uh, how we feel in the class in the classrooms. He says that uh, it has been like banned from classrooms to talk about feelings when the relation between teachers and students needs to be uh, taken care of. One of the interesting things that he mentions is attribution. And probably you have heard about that. He says that in postgrad post studies, the lecturers are complaining on how bad the students are, uh, are studying or being prepared um, at universities. Whereas the university is putting the blame on the secondary school. And he says, or they say that secondary school teachers do not teach the correct way. In turn, secondary school teachers think that primary schools are to be blamed. Primary schoolers are putting the blame on kindergarten and kindergarten, they say that uh, probably it's mommy and daddy who are to be blamed uh, for the students not learning. So his idea is that everyone needs to um, be, be responsible for the development of the students. He also talks about these misconceptions that we have in the classrooms. And these misconceptions are beliefs that are performing. Sometimes we have misconceptions of the students that we have in, um, in, in, in the lessons. And we may think that they are not interested, that they don't like learning, that uh, they don't care about anything but perhaps is they say always playing football, always thinking about playing with uh, friends. But perhaps it's not just that, it's uh, some students are very poor and sometimes they don't have breakfast before going to school. So they could be asleep, they could be tired because of working or they are simply not interested or perhaps they have uh, physical or psychological uh, disability, which needs to be uh, also faced and tackled. Sometimes they call the students donkeys. I don't know if this happens in your countries, but in my country, uh, a donkey is a person who finds it hard to learn and sometimes is ridiculed in the classrooms. So this is very painful for the students, says Santos Guerra. And these misconceptions may lead into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecies are those beliefs that the students get from adult people, from grown-ups, and sometimes may change their course of life. The suggestion that Santos Guerra gives is listen to your teachers, but don't pay attention to the bad things, to the prophecies that tell you that you're not going to learn because you need to success by yourself. If you are, if you are a person who has been uh, prophesied by a teacher, try to get over it and be successful by yourself. This is what he says. Do not believe them. Do not believe them. So it's very harmful when a teacher is saying uh, to any student that he's not or she's not able to learn. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why self? Because one believes that we can't do it because someone else has said it. It could be a parent. It could be a teacher. It could be a relative. It could be a significant other. And this is very important to have in mind, not to hurt people's feelings. This is very important in evaluation, very important. It's crucial to have in mind the students' emotions when having exams or being evaluated. That's why we talk about assessment more than evaluation. 
I promise to give you steps to success and we can talk about them all together. So what are the steps that we need to, to take in order to um, provide with a good assessment pro process? We need to observe, says Dylan William, in assessment for learning and within integral learning, we need to observe students. This observation is to be every, in every lesson. We need to keep records of those uh, observations, perhaps something that call our attention. These are things that we need to read, um, keep record of in memos, in diaries, in recordings. Now we have all the elements in order to have this evidence collected. You are collecting evidence of their progress. You are collecting evidence of performances. You're collecting evidence of the achievements of students, of the students' achievements. Another step to take in, in this case is to talk to other um, professionals, sometimes in interdisciplinary groups where uh, psychologists or social workers can give you a hand in order to tackle that problematic situations that you have observed or you have spotted in the classes. So um, observation makes you a reflective teacher. Writing it down, it's a step forward in order to solve this problem trying to see all the causes and the effects, the aftermath of the situation. Well, the second topic that uh, we can talk about derived from assessment for learning and integral assessment is one of the resources that Dylan William uses to check knowledge. And the things that we do in classes is you is to use the questions sometimes. And here I'm going to deal with some concepts of questions. Here we have Hinge, CCQs, ICQ, as you said, one of you said in the chat box, and other kinds of questions. Here we have Dylan William. You can find his videos online and his books are uh, well read and I think translated into many languages and it's a good reading. One of the key things that Dylan William um, favors, in, favors in assessment for learning is hinge questions. As you could see, this hinge in the doors, the hinges in the door, uh, allowed you to go or shut the door or open the door, maybe changing directions. This key, these hinge questions refer or are used when teachers are a bit uh, complicated with different problematic areas or students that can't um, overcome difficulties that have to do with uh, the contents, you know, we will have everything planned, but sometimes the plans uh, in paper is not the same as what we leave in the classes. So um, one of the things he offers is these hinge questions. The hinge questions are specific, carefully crafted, should inform about performance of the students, identify misconceptions, and be a brief formative assessment. Why brief formative assessment? Remember that formative assessment deals with learning. This is this kind of assessment that is focused on the students in order to help him or her learn better. This kind of assessment is uh, finding resources to help students overcome those specific difficulties they have. So these hinge questions are uh, aiming at two big things, to make decisions. We need to make decisions, says Dylan William. We make decisions, in fact, all the time. 
when we observe students, when we see that someone is uh, absent-minded looking at the window outside, when we see that somebody is with a mobile phone or somebody is um, talking too much with others or um, walking around the classroom. These are things that call our attentions and at our attention and we need to make a decision, sometimes instant decision on what to do. Experience is one of the things that will help us to make decisions and what kind of decisions um, to follow. So keeping a memo, keeping a diary will help us yes, to review the things that we have served and especially those cases that are repetitive, that are constant. So or we go on with a plan or we pivot, we change direction. Another thing is, when do we need to ask these hinge questions and how? Hinge questions, one of the ways in which uh, Dylan and other researchers have um, suggested to, to follow is as simply as asking a question like um, or a yes or no question or an or question and asking them to raise their hands. Raising their hands is a big, uh, is a huge um, research that he has carried out because not all of the students raise their, uh, their hand. And that's why we sometimes need to look, uh, have a special look to those who are a bit behind and do not want to raise their hands. Uh, in this when they do that, when you ask questions and they raise their hands, we need to be observing as well. And we are going to learn the movement or the habits of our students when raising their hands. This is especially uh, important. And Dylan Williams suggests to do it every 30 minutes, yes, or 20 minutes, or when you change the subject, you have to do these hinge questions in different ways and try not to bore them or try not to interrupt them with questions that seem to be evaluating students. Just quick questions like, uh, is it on such thing or is it about, so with these questions, you can uh, get information. So this is collection of evidence. With hinge questions or with other uh, strategies, you can collect evidence. The, quest the questions that you can make, uh, there are plenty of questions, but uh, here I found an acronym of questions. For example, quick check questions, understanding questions. We can deal with exploratory questions in when we want to leave them to research by themselves to uh, start with uh, self-learning stimulating questions, thought-provoking questions, perhaps an open-ended question, inv investigative questions, open-ended, and narrowing down questions. So like closing the topic. So imagine the many kind of questions that you can make. Try to work with um, your colleagues and think about the questions that you're going to favor this month this semester with the students because working with contents is as um, important as working with strategies and strategies need to be transversal in all subjects. So talking about that, uh, it's important in the institutions. Another thing is the observation. Observation when they raise their hands as we have already told we have already said it's important and who is the one who always um, raise their hand or perhaps not in what ways what kind of questions they like they favor uh, what are the questions that they are probably not answering or having doubts about so the steps to success regarding questions is multiple choice Generally, 
Generally, we use multiple choices in uh, hinge questions. True and false, short answers. As you could see, the things that we always do, but we are going to plan them according to the situation of learning that we have. We are going to plan these kind of hinge questions for the classes in order to check understanding. If we check understanding, we collect evidence in order to go on explaining or re-explaining or just leave it for the next unit and in a, psych in a cyclical way, we can revise the topics again. These decisions are the ones that we make all the time, but we need to be planning, focusing and uh, recording everything. Here are some examples of hinge questions. Sometimes in exams, when you are given some options to uh, choose. <clears throat> Another suggestion that I could give uh, from my experience is working with all questions, especially with beginner levels. This is uh, also raising confidence in students. The right answer should be at the end. For example, I say, uh, <clears throat> is the cat a plant or an animal? And you, of course, emphasize animal. And uh, they know that at the end, there's, uh, you're going to give the right answer. So they can associate and answer the correct and give the correct answer. This is just to stimulate, yes, uh, and prompting them to talk. So all questions sometimes is sometimes is a good way of checking, quick checking, and um, um, incentivizing them to talk. But there are other kinds of questions. I don't know if you are acquainted with. ICQ and CCQ, one of you have said it in the chat box, yes. ICQ or CCQ in teaching. Can you give me some, some tips if you know them or not? Just drop your answers in the chat box. Uh, Sarah says summative assessment. Very good, Sarah. Summative assessment. Uh, I haven't dealt with different kinds of assessments according to time, but we have diagnostic, summative, which is part of the process, which is called also uh, formative, and we have the evaluation at the end. Yes, which is the um, sorry, the summative is at the end because we have a score. Yes. Mm -hmm. So any ideas about um, ICQ and CCQ? Okay, we are going to talk about that. ICQ are instruction checking questions and CCQ is a concept checking question. Instruction checking questions are perhaps something that we don't use it that much we don't use that much. And perhaps this is the root of many of the problems with the students not understanding, not grasping what they have to do in an exam, in a test. And this is sometimes the problem that we are facing when we have low scores uh, of the students. Because we need to teach not only content, but strategies, but also strategies. Strategies is very important, the procedures, uh, analyzing the instructions, knowing what to do. And of course, uh, teachers need not to uh, give uh, activities that are that you haven't been uh, trying during the course uh, with your students. Instruction checking questions. Asked to make sure that the learners know what they are supposed to be doing to alert them to the key meanings of the instructions. So we are going to ask them to identify the key elements or the key words in the instruction and um, asking all questions, for example, in order to see if they have understood what to do in the exercise. Another thing that will help um, to help students to understand is to give an example. 
If you're giving an exam, always provide them with an example in order to make them uh, very clear what to do. And CCQ, CCQ stands for Concept Checking Question. They are used to check students' understanding of a specific concept or topic. It aims to ensure that all students have fully understood the key ideas, vocabulary, or grammar structures being taught. And this is very specific. If we are dealing with vocabulary, you can do questions with pictures. You can play Kahoot. You can play different games with um, that um, with that kind of questions. Or you can use grammar points in order to ask them to uh, if they have understood or not. Yes, very quick questions. Another way uh, of checking students' understanding is using exit tickets at the end, at the end of the class. Uh, and they can identify, for example, three things that they uh, have learned the good thing is that sometimes the keywords for me are not the keywords for my classmate. And when they mention all the words that they have learned, everyone is reminding of the rest. So it has uh, for the level of mastery or area of, of difficulties, because you will identify the areas of difficulty if you ask them. If you ask them, for example, the three things or one thing that you haven't understood very well, opportunities to reteach with the information that you have collected and gaps in learners understanding because you have a bridge into the problem and helping the students to uh, study again or read it again and learn it better. So one example of exit ticket could be three things that I learned today two things I want to learn more, or one question I have, yes, in the question I have, this could be the problem he needs or she needs to tackle. So this is when teacher is saying goodbye, but then the teacher is collecting, the teacher is recording, the teacher is thinking ahead in the decisions he or she has to, to do for the forthcoming classes. Now as an exercise, Look at this picture that, that I've taken from a um, pupil's book and you have the instruction. Read the instruction and look at the pictures, look at the poster. In the poster, you can identify the pictures or spot the pictures of the animals. In the chat box, you will write me or an ICQ uh, ICQ question or CC question, okay? So something about the instruction, questions about the instruction, and what question would you make to check the concepts? At least two examples, could you? CCQ, content checking questions, and ICQ, instruction checking questions. Once you read the instruction, sorry, once you read the instruction, sorry, um, how can you check that they have understood? One example. Find the number, says the, the instruction. The question, uh, let's see, somebody has popped in in the in the chat box. Is there a cat in the pig? Excellent, very good. Is there a cat in the pig? In the pig, very good. Excellent. Another question for the instruction. Janam says, can... "What can you see?" What can you see? Very good, excellent. What can you see and identify the objects? In the case of the instruction. Find, the, find a number, you can ask them, for example, do you have to write or do you have to write numbers? And they will, of course, say write numbers. So in that case, you are checking the understanding of the instruction. Sometimes we overlook the ICQ 
the instruction checking questions. And we only deal with content uh, checking questions. So it's very important that we um, get used to asking questions about the instructions. Drop the photo to the place. Very good. Excellent. So you are reframing the instruction. Excellent, uh, Jainan. Paint the animal you like the most. Mm -hmm. Very good. That is a good instruction. Mm -hmm. Jainan. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you can follow, you can go on practicing with this kind of questions. I would like you to, to write in the chat box, never mind if we go on, because I need you to, I need, I need to say if you have understood. So when we deal with instructions, we need to ask questions with the keywords. For example, uh, do we have to write or talk in the instruction? And then do we have to um, paint or uh, play? So they, with all questions, they can identify what to do. Or you can ask, do we have to play first and write second and say afterwards? or the other way around. So uh, dealing with instructions will help a lot of problems that students are coming through in their learning and exams. We can do many activities with such an activity. Yes, a lot, of course, yes. Yes, you can do a lot of activities, but if you have to teach this instruction, we need to make questions with the ICQ. It's easy with CCQ and we can invent a lot, but we need to check if they have understood what to do. Otherwise they will be painting the circles and not uh, adding a number, for example, the number that they identify in the picture. So we need to make sure that they understood. Do we have to- Alexandra, Mary shares another question. And that is uh, that ICQ, what are you going to do first? Do we have to distinguish the, dif the different characters? Mm -hmm. What we have to do first is ICQ in order to check understanding in this case, and then CCQ once they have uh, worked with the picture, you can ask all the questions that you have given as examples. But in the class, when you teach, for example, the simple present, the inflections with the simple present verbs, you can ask CCQs, yes, all the time and not ICQs, just CCQs. For example, she likes, uh, she, she goes with like or likes. So that could be a CCQ question because you are checking content. Well, one is for content and the other one is for the instruction. ICQ, CCQ. Let's see. What are the steps to success in this case with questions? We need to plan and we need to practice. We need to uh, revise the planning that we have for the months for the sequence and uh, provide the questions that we need in order to um, check understanding. This is collection of evidence for Dylan William. Remember, revising again, looking at, a, for example, flicking through the books, the, the books that you have, and see what activities are those uh, that have uh, more problematic topics or instructions. When you find and identify those problematic activities, think and make a list of at least three ICQ questions, instruction con, uh, checking questions, and then do the CCQs. Somebody else has, is the hand on the bed? Very good. Mm -hmm. Another CCQ question. So plan, revise, and try to perform yes, yourself with those problematic activities that your book has. Um, and number three, we are going to deal with mistakes. I'm going to rush over because it's um, a bit late. 
I would like to talk about that and have a lot of time, but just some words and tips in order you to go on digging into the topic and thinking ahead uh, about assessment in your classes. We're going to deal with mistakes. There are many authors who talk about errors, mistakes, and slips. Sometimes the key word or the holistic word is errors and not mistakes. But in most of the cases for TEFL courses, especially um, courses on um, TKT, for example, the base is on uh, mistakes. So the key word is mistakes. Mistakes is like the most, um, the, the word that references all the different situations when the students are not giving the correct answer. Out of mistakes, we can think about errors itself, errors themselves, and slips. What do we mean by errors? Errors are present in our classes in language learning and foreign language learning, especially foreign language learning, with three or at least three factors. Developmental errors, interference of language one, and fossilized errors. Developmental, it means uh, these errors that have to do with the evolution, the cognitive evolution of the students. Interference of language one is when the your own native language is interfering with English and perhaps you take uh, some verbs that you use and not the ones that um, are the right collocation in language two. Fossilized errors are probably the ones that are more difficult to, um, to um, tackle. Uh, fossilized have to, do, have to do with errors that uh, come from many years, probably from kindergarten, if a teacher is mispronouncing a word, you will have this fossilized error when you are uh, speaking in English. Slips. What are the slips? Slip, it doesn't, uh, we, does, we do not include in slips these developmental errors, these uh, incapacities to understand. No, slips are lapsus or moments where you can't answer correctly because you are tired, you've been working the whole night, uh, perhaps because you are absent-minded with your mobile phone, or perhaps because you are getting late into classes all the time and you can grasp the meaning from the very beginning or with the consistency that you need to do it. So slips are something that we need to identify in order not to um, score them with uh, a bad uh, number, for example, with a low number, uh, but probably work with habits, work with organization. And this is called self-regulation of students. The students need to self-regulate their time, their schedules, their agenda, their, uh, the things they need to, the, the things they need to work with. Whereas errors are things that need to be covered. We need to think about strategies in order uh, to solve those problems. Let's uh, see some of them. Developmental errors have to do sometimes, and you can see uh, in the picture, a boy who is trying hard to learn. So you need to be in contact with him, close to him or her in order to help them uh, advance. They are unconscious. Sometimes we see that when they are learning to talk, even in language one, when they are learning to talk, sometimes uh, they sometimes make mistakes. Uh, so they are not pronouncing the whole word, but they think unconsciously that they do it. So we don't have to, uh, we need to correct or in a chorus repetition, but do not uh, telling them, not telling them that they are wrong because they can't understand it because this is a subconscious or unconscious process. And in time, they will get the right 
uh, answer if they are immersing into the language. So that is why talking to them is very important and talking to students in English is very important. Incomplete processes has to do with they are learning the simple present, but they, st they still need more time in order to fix the morphological uh, or syntactic uh, elements of the tense. So perhaps you need to not to stick on the same topic all the time, but to leave it for another uh, unit where you can see different things. So now I'm going to see the third person singular next time the first person singular in the plural and the singular for example so you make decisions according to that according to what you say over generalization is when you think that all of them have the same problem that this year it will be the same as last year and you are covering that yes in order to tackle those problems it could happen or not and also interlanguage Interlanguage is when we mix and we have these um, lapsus into or um, when we interchange languages, language one and language two. We are going to see that in detail. For example, the interference of language one. This is the other case when our mother tongue interferes in our learning. For example, dealing with uh, false friends. Yes, dealing with false friends, especially in Spanish. Uh, Spanish is a romantic language, so it's very close to English and French and Italian. And uh, as you have your language similar to other languages, and sometimes we confuse. Yes, we think that one um, that this word seems to be the same as in our language, and it is not. Another thing in interference of language one is collocations. So uh, we need to, this is something cultural and this has to do with languages, probably with no reasons. Uh, we could think that uh, logically we could use the word powerful for, co for tea or coffee, but in, 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 in fact, they say, uh, native speakers say strong tea or strong coffee, tall tree and not high tree. So this has to do with uh, how the native speakers talk. And one way of doing it is immersion into the language, immersing the students into the, into the uh, language too, into English, talk to them in English, everything in English. And last, uh, and the last case of errors is fossilized errors. And the errors could be, the origins could be morphological, phonological, syntactic, pragmatic, semantic and phonological could be um, something that had to that had, that uh, has to do with the language interference for example for some places uh, in some places the uh, sound and the, the sound like in Persian can't be pronounced because they don't have those sounds so instead of saying think they say think and um, in our cases with our romantic languages, we have a lot, yes? For example, the final E, the S, uh, the end, um, or the, um, the stress at the last of the sentences, for example. Another kind of morphological uh, errors that could be fossilized are the S, for example, uh, in the present simple or the ed in the past, all of those are morphological, morph means form, um, that could be fossilized. Of course, also dealing with many things. For example, if I, if I am in unit number one for two months saying, I am Maria, I am from Argentina, I am a so-and-so years old, uh, when they when it comes to talk about likes and dislike, they will say I'm like. Why? Because you have stayed a lot of time with I'm, I'm, I'm. So they have understood or acquired, acquired that um is with I in all cases. So be careful with that. Drilling is okay in order to uh, work with different vocabulary or lexis, but uh, Exaggerating on that and keeping a lot of time on that will uh, or may fossilize 
content. Syntactic. Syntactic errors had to do with word order, for example. It has many, uh, many other situations, but word order could be one. Pragmatic. Pragmatic has to do with these false friends that I've been talking about. When you try to communicate with native speakers and sometimes you don't get the, um, they don't understand, they don't get you because uh, culturally speaking, you are not saying the same thing. And semantic is, for example, ha having to do with meaning. Sometimes meanings and play with words is some of the things we need to practice in the classes. Uh, last but not least is feedback. And we're going to study feedback, <clears throat> not feedback of learning, which is going and looking back into the learning process, but feedback for learning, which uh, is the one that uh, Black and Williams suggest and many others like uh, Santos Guerra and many other researchers favor. Uh, feedback for learning is having this evidence collected, elicited, the things that we have been talking about, about questions, about the way we can uh, prompt things to say or identifying errors. All this collection in your memos, in your diaries is food for work because this is the, um, the fuel for your next classes, for the directions that you need to follow in the forthcoming units or the uh, for the whole year for example so feedback needs to be uh, thought uh, for helping students helping them advance helping them overcome those particular areas of errors or difficulties that they may show and this cyclical um, um, drawing that i'm showing here it's important when I, as, as I told you before, not to stuck uh, in, not to get stuck in one specific unit until the, everybody knows it. No, they sometimes need time. They sometimes need time. Just present it, go on with the next unit, present the same thing with other words, with other situations. If the simple present here was about people, you can do the simple present with animals. You can do the simple present with uh, were issues. So you can change, you can make those decisions. Feedback for learning has to do with ego evolving. And here Santo Guerra has a lot to do. Ego evolving has to do with the emotions, how you make the students feel when you tell them what to do, what they need. This feedback needs to be constructive, needs to strengthen students' um, abilities, skills, and focus on those they need to um, get better. So what can you see in this picture? The teacher is guiding, the teacher is showing, the teacher is present with the students, perhaps telling them what to do. But what we are aiming to is to um, get a student who is self-confident, um, who is uh, studying by himself or herself, a person who is not dependent, the person who is self-regulated. Self-regulation is a key word nowadays in assessment. So uh, we need to go from this scene to the scene of the students learning by themselves. Feedback, the do and don'ts of feedback. The do's are, we should give immediate feedback sometimes. Immediate feedback is praising someone, yes? Uh, this is taken from research. Students who receive immediate feedback perform better in classes because they feel confident. So don't be afraid to give immediate feedback, uh, giving applause or saying something or with a badge perhaps, be prepared with the feedback. So you prepare the feedback beforehand. This is immediate, but you can also prepare it beforehand uh, and give it to the particular student. So this is individualized, not uh, in, the, in front of the group. Stick to facts. 
It could be individual, as I said, or group feedback. Uh, you can encourage input. So you, you provide the information that is, you highlight the information that is that needs checking and the students can provide input and rethink about what they've done. Causes to improve and helps to understand. What we don't have to do is a, a feedback which is confusing, demotivating, uh, general, generalizing things, embarrassing students or judging students. We need to avoid that in order to raise their self uh, self esteem. Yes, like Santo Guerra and many others say. Well, in order to fo to finish this webinar, um, I would like you to write in the chat box three things that you have learned, that you have picked, that you remember. I know that this is this has been very very fast, uh, and we couldn't be um, devoting more time in certain topics. But try to remember what are the things that you have learned or you have picked from today's less today's webinar. You can drop in the chat box. If you write the three things or two things, other people can uh, recall on those concepts as well. Zahra says uh, self-regulation, socialization. Mm -hmm. And here on YouTube chat, Martha says, thanks for all those insights. Very clarifying for me. Fatima says, difference between ITQ and CCQ. Mahmoud says, formative assessment is for teacher as well, how well he is teaching. Thank you. This is a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much, honorable presenter. Many thanks. Many thanks. All right. Thank you very much. I would like to thank um, the organization uh, for this opportunity. I really long for being here. I have been probably very um, nervous. <laughs> I had to reframe what I said. Um, because I really, I really wanted to be in these workshops, in these webinars, uh, helping teachers. This is what I do. I'm a teacher trainer. I'm a researcher. And I would like to go on um, showing you some of the research or the things that we deal with uh, in the groups, in the professional group. Thank you very much to the organization, to Teachers Development Webinars, and all of you to be present. And let's see if you have contributed with something else. Formative assessment, ICQ and CCQ. Very good. Excellent. Self-regulation, fossilization. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you take all those uh, concepts and develop and work with them in uh, with a group of colleagues at your institutions. Many thanks. I will stop sharing the screen. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Maria. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, you know, many of us uh, could learn a lot of things about integral and formative assistance from you. And we really appreciate this opportunity to have your teacher development webinars. Now, the floor is open for questions and answers if you have any questions you can share in the chat. So I see this uh, uh, question in the chat. Uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, participants were disturbed for that webinar have submitted their questions before and so there was a question that you know is there any difference between you know integral and formative assessment you see uh you know it is it the same thing integral and formative assessment the difference between uh, assessment and formative assessment well assess assessment is um it's a word that is done only in english because in my language, we have the, only the word evaluation. So I'm very glad to have that word, um, to have that word in, sorry, sorry, I've been losing here. Um, well, assessment is a holistic term. Assessment deals with an integral view of 
the uh, learning process. That's why mm -hmm. assessment is not just the summative view of evaluation, as you've said before, some of you, but this progress, this development in a lesson, in the sequence, or in the course of um, in the course of studies. And the key thing about assessment is the collection of evidence. When you collect evidence, then assessment becomes assessment for learning and not assessment of learning. Assessment or evaluation of learning means looking back in time for the things that you have already done, but it, they say they call it something dead. And if you deal with assessment for learning, is the vision is forward. You know, the, the, they call it fast um, um, feed forward. Feed forward because you are feeding from what is going to happen afterwards. If you collect the evidence, you can analyze, you can record the information, you can reckon, think about that, and make a decision for the forthcoming classes. That's why we have this difference between evaluation, which is called, uh, which is related to measurement, assessment, a wider topic, which involves the process, and assessment for learning, the collection of evidence in order to make decisions. And how you uh, communicate those decisions is with feedback. Feedback of learning is looking back in time. Feedback for learning is this feedback that helps grow, it helps students grow. I don't know if I um, if I answered your question. So yeah, but if we talk about formative and integral assessment, so is it the same? Are the different concepts? Mm -hmm. Yes, formative. formative and individual, you say? Integral, the first uh, letter of uh, webinar title. Integral. Uh, well, integral, integral assessment differs from the formative in that it includes the emotions. It includes um, having in mind the student's self-regulation uh, it helps the students to uh, overcome difficulties by themselves, not believing in the prophecies that sometimes teachers sometimes unconsciously say. We sometimes say, oh, but you are so hard to understand that. And this is a prophecy for them. So we need to be careful with the things we say, the manner we say it, and it happens to everyone, like parents. But we need to... Um, be reflective on that. And this reflection makes um, teaching different. So for me, that is integrative. And also we need to have in mind in integrative formative assessment that uh, the students sometimes are going through different, different situations, sometimes hunger, sometimes uh, they are probably with some learning difficulties or probably they have been having uh, some situations at home. So we need to consider many issues and not just the uh, very exam or test that we have planned. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So the next question is from Abdul Aziz and he asked that every student is at a different level of learning. So should we have individualized assessment then? Yes, of course. Individualized learning is um, when you observe students, you know your students, and you can uh, register, um, uh, I mean, record whatever happens in the classes with that student. You can prepare something for this person without mentioning it. So you can present, for example, you can see that there's a student, and it happens to me, that do not speak that much. So I find the situations where they speak in pairs two or three times during the class. And then I change the groups into fours, into threes, and then group work and whatever. Uh, but I give this, this person the opportunity to talk with classmates. Because when they talk to classmates, they are not 
um, embarrassed. So you find the way to solve that problem to that student. And then if the person um, is not going to be of, uh, embarrassed, you can talk to them in private and telling them what to do. So you give us a, a list or steps of things to do, or you can work together in order to um, find these steps to follow. So this is also self-regulation. But the important thing is self uh, to feel to feel to have self-esteem and um, be self-assured. You have to have a look of, uh, of all the group, but also you can identify particular cases. I'm sure we all have these particular cases. And one thing of uh, that I do to record students that I haven't mentioned is, for example, ask them to record themselves. At the beginning of the year, they record themselves describing a picture, for example. And in two months time, they have to describe the same picture again and see if they had advanced in the language. And they can see by themselves what they need. If they need to revise uh, the simple present, if they need to revise adjectives, if they need to revise the word order and all that. Yeah, that was very well answered in the book. So maybe just one last question that how can integral and formative assessment be adapted to different uh, about different levels of proficiency and age groups you think? Well, uh, to different levels of proficiency. In fact, I work with advanced students and C1, C2 students and is always um, thinking about that. For example, I don't have formal tests or formal exams. I don't have midterms exams, for example. Uh, what I work with is with projects. Uh, working with projects or working with this kind of... Um, vivid language in the classroom, we don't have to go through different exams in order to know what they know. They have the activities during the classes, and then there's a re um, they research by themselves according to different topics within the topic, uh, giving their view on that uh, critical think with critical thinking, strategies to talk and the sort. And and they can see the progress that they have. And I can see the progress as well. So I can apply it in all levels and in all institutions. Uh, I know that sometimes there are some requirements to have a score, but you can um, also, with through rubrics, you can uh, work with certain scores within integral uh, and formative assessment. But yes, you can apply it. Dr. Maria Alverga Alba, it was a pleasure having you at Teacher Development Webinars. Thank you very much for your presence and sharing all your expertise. We really appreciate that. And a big thank you to everyone in attendance. We really appreciate your presence at you and for your wonderful questions and comments and uh, you know sharing your thoughts about this webinar. So if you want a certificate for this webinar, you can email us at info.pdwebinar at the rate of gmail.com. For uh, future webinars, you can register for them at uh, website www.pdwebinars.org. We are available on all our social media channels, that is X, formerly called Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, we have a Facebook group too, and then this recording will be you know, shared on a uh, teacher development webinars, the YouTube channel, where you can subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends if you want to. So this was all about today. We are uh, celebrating and observing a Ramadan here in Pakistan and other Muslim world. So it's a holy month for us. So happy Ramadan to everyone. And we hope, uh, you know, it, uh, it goes uh, well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much to all of you.